This video discusses real gross domestic product and the consumption multiplier. The goal of most governments is to maximize economic output and sustain economic growth. The multiplier is recognized as an effect that augments government actions to stimulate the economy and the actions of other participants within the economy. The government may determine that it must stimulate the economy due to a recession with increased spending. The initial amount of the spending package will have a direct impact on GDP as the G component of the equation is increased to compensate for decreases in the other components. But the infusion of money also causes a chain reaction of additional spending since the dollars spent are received and then spent again several times over throughout the year. Some economists call the multiplier effect the Keynesian multiplier. John Maynard Keynes did most of his work during the Great Depression. The mainstay classical economic theory at the time did not really reflect the economic conditions of the 1930s. In the depth of the Depression, Keynes did not totally reject classical theory, but held that adjustments in the long run would take too long. He stated that, in the long run, we are all dead. The classical view held that, in the long run, an economy's productive capacity is not dependent on prices, represented by the vertical long-run aggregate supply curve. The classical theory contended that price facilitates transactions, but the economy is dependent on the number and capacity of the resources. If the government infused money into the economy, all that would happen is prices would increase. Increases in aggregate demand from a stimulus would simply shift the aggregate demand curve to the right, inflating prices as demand would be greater than the economy's ability to supply sufficient products. Finally, their belief was that the only way to increase the economy is through new technology, additional workers, new and more productive resources. While Keynes did not disagree with some parts of the long-run theory, he contended that the focus must be on the short-run aggregate supply. Keynes observed that people had been suffering for a long period of time and could not wait for the economy to self-adjust. Businesses were not operating, and workers were not working. Both had the desire and the capacity but there were inventories that were not selling. Why hire workers to produce more inventory that would go unsold? If workers and factories could only come together, they could again produce goods and services, distribute inventories, and increase economic wealth. In the past, self-correcting classical economists had observed downturns in the economy, where aggregate demand decreased, moving the curve to the left. Lowering prices would make goods, services, resources, prices, and wages more attractive, and this would stimulate the economy. Keynes observed that in the very short run, prices will not be affected by a drop in the aggregate demand. While the pricing system is the mechanism that coordinates the activities in the economy and signals to producers the consumer's demands, prices do not instantly adjust. Businesses do not immediately drop their prices. Workers do not immediately take lower paying jobs and resource suppliers will not accept lower compensation for their products that they have invested in. Keynes described prices in the very short run as being sticky. The modern Keynesian model shows the long run aggregate supply curve as a vertical line representing full employment. However, the short run aggregate supply curve represents the concept that prices, wages, and other compensation for resources are sticky and do not immediately fall as demand declines. The aggregate demand curve moves to the left away from full employment when prices stay the same or very slightly decrease. When demand increases and the curve shifts to the right, prices will increase in as much as all resources are already fully employed. In the short run, resources can be stretched with overtime wages and higher rents, but constant increases cannot be sustained over a long period of time. This is a question similar to one you might see on the next exam. In the classical model, an increase in the unemployment rate, A, will persist when the reduction in output is caused by a reduction in aggregate demand, B, will result in an increase in the price level if the reduction in output is caused by a change in aggregate demand, C, will likely be temporary, D, is a signal of demand pull inflation. And the answer is C, will likely be temporary. Another question, what is the underlying assumption of the original simplified Keynesian model? A, the relevant range of the short run aggregate supply curve is vertical. B, the relevant range of the aggregate supply curve is vertical. C, the relevant range of the short run aggregate supply curve is horizontal. Or D, 
the relevant range of the long run aggregate supply curve is horizontal? And the answer is C. The relevant range of the short run aggregate supply curve is horizontal because of sticky prices. A third possible question is according to the Keynesian model, the short run aggregate supply curve is horizontal when A. Real gross domestic product is at full capacity, but prices are not flexible. B. There are no unemployment resources and wages do not change when prices change. C. Prices react to an aggregate demand shock, but real gross domestic product does not. Or D. There are unemployed resources and prices do not fall when aggregate demand falls. And the answer is D. There are unemployed resources and prices do not fall when aggregate demand falls. There are two things that we can do with real after-tax income. We can consume goods and services, or we can save part of that income. Consumer spending is defined as the spending on new goods and services from current household income. Income that is not consumed is, of course, saved. A comparison of the two economic theories are presented here. The classical model identifies that savings is determined by the prevailing interest rate. In other words, with higher interest rates, it acts as an incentive for people to save more. The Keynesian model holds that the interest rate is not the most important factor in saving and consumption decisions, that real savings and consumption decisions depend on household real disposable income, and finally, anticipation about future flows of income influences how much income will be allocated to consumption and how much to savings. Over time, consumption follows a relatively smooth upward trend. Its growth declines during periods of recession, but the overall trend is positive. What kinds of things affect the level of consumption? First, current disposable income. Second, household wealth. Third, expected future incomes. Fourth, the price level, inflation. And fifth, interest rates. Saving is the act of not consuming all of one's current income. By definition, what is not consumed is saved. Saving is an activity. The act of saving is a flow of money. Savings, on the other hand, are a stock of money which is accumulated from the act of savings. If aggregate expenditures is equal to the GDP, then inventories are unchanged and the economy is in macroeconomic equilibrium. If, however, aggregate expenditure is less than GDP, then inventories rise and GDP and employment decrease. If aggregate expenditure is greater than GDP, inventories fall, GDP and employment rises. The consumption function is the relationship between the amount consumed and disposable income. A consumption function tells us how much people plan to consume at various levels of disposable income. Keynesian theory is based upon the hypothesis that a. Saving and consumption are influenced primarily by real current disposable income. B. Saving is influenced primarily by the interest rate. C. Planned savings equals planned investment only at full employment. And D. Full employment is automatically attained in any economy. And the answer is A. Saving and consumption are influenced primarily by real current disposable income. The average propensity to consume is real consumption divided by the real disposable income. It is the proportion of total disposable income that is consumed. An example of the propensity to consume would have income at $54,000, consumption at $49,200, and savings at $4,800. Question is, what is the average propensity to consume? In this case, we would take the $49,200 and divide it by the $54,000 to identify that the average propensity to consume is 0.911. In the second example, income has now increased by $6,000 to $60,000. Consumption is equal to $54,000 and savings is equal to $6,000. What is the average propensity to consume? $54,000 divided by $60,000 is 0.9 or 90 percent. We've established by definition that income can either be consumed or saved. And so when we look at the average propensity to save, the formula would be real savings divided by real disposable income. Again, we're looking at the ratio between our real savings and our real disposable income. 
The marginal propensity to consume is a third tool that we can use in analyzing changes in the macroeconomy. The marginal propensity to consume is the ratio of change in real consumption to a change in real disposable income. The consumption function provides a visual graph that begins to build a model of gross domestic product. The dark orange line shows the increase in real GDP on the x-axis and the relationship to planned consumption per year on the y-axis. Again, the 45 degree line equates consumption to income. Planned consumption considers the propensity to consume and the propensity to save. These three charts show the addition of investment to consumption in calculating GDP. Note in panel three that the level of planned investment is added vertically to the consumption function curve. On the left, the investment level is determined by the potential interest rates. Only at equilibrium real GDP will planned savings equal actual savings. Planned investment equals actual investments. Hence, planned savings is equal to planned investment. Adding another component of GDP vertically completes the GDP graph. Which of the following is true? A. The marginal propensity to consume minus the marginal propensity to save is equal to 1. B. The marginal propensity to consume plus the marginal propensity to save equals 1. C. The marginal propensity to consume multiplied by the marginal propensity to save equals 1. Or D. The marginal propensity to consume divided by the marginal propensity to save equals 1. And the answer is the marginal propensity to consume plus the marginal propensity to save is equal to 1. The consumption multiplier is the ratio of the change in the equilibrium level of real national income resulting in changes in autonomous expenditures. It is the number that when multiplied with the absolute change in autonomous real investment or autonomous real consumption predicts the overall change in the equilibrium GDP. We begin with the assumption that a $100 billion stimulus by the government could increase equilibrium GDP by $500 billion. We begin our analysis with the assumption that the marginal propensity to consume is 80% of disposable income. The $100 billion infused into the economy immediately increases GDP by $100 billion as this is the money that is spent as consumption, investment, and net exports. We know that what is one person's expenditure is another person's income. So the $100 billion received by individuals and firms will be spent on an 80% consumption, 20% savings ratio. The GDP is next increased by $80 billion as the money is exchanged for goods and services in the second round. The third group receives $80 billion in income and turns around and spends $64 billion on consumption and $16 billion in savings. This circular flow of money through the economy is described as the velocity of money as we count the number of times a dollar changes hands through all rounds of exchange. In the end, a $100 billion infusion of money into the economy has created a domino effect and multiplied resulting in an increase in GDP of $500 billion. In the previous example, we identified that the marginal propensity to consume was 0.8, leaving the marginal propensity to save at 0.2. To derive the multiplier, we divide 0.2, which is the marginal propensity to save, into 1, and that gives us a product of 5. The multiplier is 5 times $100 billion, and that's how it grows to be $500 billion increase in the gross domestic product. Here are the key determinants over discussion on consumption and savings. In the classical model, the interest rate is the fundamental determinant of savings. In the Keynesian model, the primary determinant is disposable income. When disposable income increases, so will consumption. The key determinants of planned investment include interest rates, business expectations, productive technology, and business taxes. How is investment defined as an economic concept? A. Investment is primarily a market value of all shares of stock held by the public. B. Investment is primarily the market value of all equipment, buildings, and inventories held by corporations, partnerships, and proprietorships. C. Investment is primarily the sum of expenditures by businesses on new capital goods that will yield a future stream of income. Or D. Investment is primarily the portion of your savings held in an interest earning account. And the answer is C. Investment is primarily the sum of expenditures by businesses on new capital goods that will yield a future stream of income.
So in summary, autonomous changes in total plant expenditures have a multiplier effect on the equilibrium of GDP. As consumption increases, so does real GDP, which includes additional consumption spending. The ultimate expansion of real GDP is equal to the multiplier times the increase in autonomous expenditures.